Hello. Hi, is this Jesse? This is Jesse. All right. Well, let me do the official introduction, ladies and gentlemen. We're very excited to welcome our featured guest this evening to the show. He is an American actor, film director, and screenwriter, and we are so honored to welcome the one and only Jesse Lee Vint the third to the show. You're on the air with Terry and Tiffany. Welcome, Jesse. Well, thank you for that. And I see you have an 818, so where are you calling from? Uh, we're actually just a little bit north of Hollywood, but we're up in the forest. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I didn't know that. For some reason, I thought you were several states away. Uh, I didn't realize that, so. Oh, we definitely okay. ought to get you up here. You're in, like, Oklahoma, right? Uh, not right now. Right now, I'm in Los Angeles. I'm, I'm here on business. I had to do my taxes and come in for a while. And uh, and then uh, I will stay here for a month or two, and then I'll uh, start traveling the world again. I was in 32 countries last year, so. Yeah, uh, tell us a little bit about that. I mean, obviously, we want to talk about your entire career and things like that. But I was looking at your Facebook page, and I was seeing all these amazing photos of you all <laughs> over the world. What what was that yeah. all about? Where did you go? What did I mean, you do? You're you're a bit of a Jack London. Oh, man, you just paid me the biggest compliment a man could ever pay me right there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, well, I'm a little bit of a hyper antsy type of person. Mm -hmm. I'm very restless, and I get bored very easily. And it, it's, it's, a, it's actually been a problem that I've had <laughs> throughout my lifetime that caused me to get thrown out of many classes in high school and junior high school. And, and uh, uh, you know, I... They, I I was thrown out of two different high schools, in fact, and they finally sent me to a military academy where wow. I had no way of escaping. <laughs> 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 and uh, But I had a good time there, actually. It was a it, probably the, one of the best experiences I've ever had. And uh, uh, But going around the world was uh, uh, a, a big challenge for me, something I always wanted to do. And I started out because it was in the wintertime, and I left in December of last year mm -hmm. uh, to... Uh, go to the Philippines, and then Indonesia, and then Malaysia, and then Thailand, and then Hong Kong, and then Sri Lanka, and then uh, uh, India. And then from there, I had to fly back to do my taxes. Uh, taxes. It was February, and then I returned. Uh, but before I did that, I took a cruise for two weeks in the Caribbean. Wow. And then I, I went back, and I started out in Malta, and I was moving north as it got warmer into uh, March, April, and May uh, into Europe. Uh, so I went from Malta to Sicily to Rome and then uh, took a cruise uh, in the Mediterranean for two weeks over to the Grecian Islands in Athens, which was uh, outstanding and uh, uh, definitely not a disappointment. <laughs> Some places were a disappointment, but that was not. Uh, Barcelona, number one. Uh, don't miss Barcelona. Don't miss Copenhagen. I can go on and on here, but yes, I had a great time. And uh, it was it was. It was a. Uh, it's in my DNA, you know, uh, to to travel and to see and to experience. And I've always loved these books. And Jack London been my favorite since I was 13 years old because he had a a uh, I guess an obsession with travel. And I also like Jack Kerouac, although people are going to laugh at me, but I think. Jack London was ten times the writer of the <laughs> For sure. You know, I can envision that you're not somebody that, that likes the luxuries. I can envision you as having a backpack and roughing it and out there maybe oh, you're exactly the, right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like you're not for the first class traveling kind of guy. Oh, definitely not. Definitely not. As a matter of fact, uh, when I traveled, I, I usually got rooms uh, that were like around 90 or $100 in, uh -huh. in uh, starting out in Old Town. I would always book in Old Town wherever I went. I went to probably 60 or 70 cities and uh, um, because Old Town is where the history begins mm -hmm. and it radiates out from that point and so uh, early on I would I would get the double decker bus tour with the English translation learn everything I possibly could about the history of the country country and the history of the city itself and all the highlights and then I'd come back to those places that, that I love so much and uh, uh, it was just always full of surprises that's the great thing and then at night Another set of surprises. <laughs> well, you said something about a certain number of countries you didn't really care for. Uh, any stories, things that happened? or Oh, there was no negative things that happened. People said, were you safe? Were you safe? I was never, ever threatened by anybody. Oh, uh -huh. Actually, there was one guy that just got off the boat in Africa, uh, from Africa, and he was threatening everybody in this uh, square in Rome. And he came up to me, well, 
I didn't back up. I didn't take a step backward. Let me put it that way. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not surprised. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, he just we stared at each other for a while, and he took off some brass brass knuckles that he had on his hand, slipped them in his pocket, wow. and and turned around, and walked off. And if he'd caught me with those brass knuckles, I would have been out to this day. <laughs> but, wow. But uh, yeah. But anyway, that was the only time. But you know something. Uh, I could have walked away from that, and I didn't. And if I was smart, which I'm not, I would have walked away from it. Well, you so, kind of have a, a reputation, and I know you're definitely a, a tough guy, and, and I would even probably guess that you've probably done most of your own stunts. Am I right? Well, uh, no, sir, not really. Now, uh, i tell you why. Uh, people that say that they do their own stunts, there's a little bit of an exaggeration that goes along with that because uh -huh. it's not that they don't have the ability to do right. the stunts. They probably do. Um, you know, like Robert Conrad, for example, uh, I love that guy, and, and he could do anything that a stuntman could do. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, he was just a very virile, athletic guy, and he was not afraid of anything. Uh, but it doesn't make sense for... The reason that you use a stuntman is because if a stuntman breaks his leg, it does not stop the production. Oh, yeah, yeah. If Robert Conrad breaks his leg, it stops the production at $100,000 a day or whatever it is. And so that's why. That's exactly. So it has nothing to do with this. Uh, well, of course, at times it does. Uh, stuntmen are highly trained specialists. Uh, I worked with quite a few of them. And there is the daredevil type. Uh, fewer in numbers than the scientific type. And those are the ones that wear pads on their knees, pads on because that's what they do for a living and they can't become disabled if they do become disabled they're out of business right. you know and so they protect themselves pretty well and they use as much science as they can so it's not always what it, it seems to be you know well i i, um, I know tempers do flare and one time i know for a fact that you kind of maybe forgot yourself and, and let the situation get the best of you did you not kick timothy dalton's ass <laughs> oh, I did. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, I did. Let's hear about right. that. But okay, but that was not that w we were not shooting the movie at that time. Oh. Uh, what what happened? What happened was, it, you know, I'm trying to be brief here. Right. Uh, so uh, I'll just say Timothy, Timothy and I squared off in front of the Holiday Inn in Del Rio, Texas, at about three o'clock in the afternoon, wow. and there was a lot of people gathered around because we we're getting ready to go out to location on the shooting. Uh, a television series for Universal Studios called Centennial, which was a big, massive, 26-hour project that every, had every star that you could possibly imagine. <laughs> <laughs> and it was just a river of stars that came through that production, I want to tell you. And it was helmed by John Wilder. Uh, he's a, a creative genius that adapted James Mister's novel uh, to, for Universal. And he directed a lot of sequences, and he was overseeing everything. Uh, but uh, uh, he and I got into a, uh, a thing right away, and uh, Timothy and I. And and uh, so uh, he said, well, let me put it to you this way, sir. As everybody gathered around, he, he began sounding very Shakespearean. And <laughs> he did. I'm, I'm serious. <laughs> let me put it to you this way, sir. I'll either fight you to your death or I'll buy you a drink, whichever you prefer. I think at that point you knew you were going to win because, you know. <laughs> Well, well, I, at that point, I said, how about we fight to the death? And I hit him as hard as I could with a straight right hand. Wow. And he ran backwards and landed on his back, and I thought he was gone for a week. <laughs> uh, but nope, he jumped right up, and he came charging at me saying, I'll kill you, uh -huh. you son of a bitch. Uh -huh. And everybody, everybody jumped in between trying to break us up, everybody. And they were getting hit because Tim was throwing a lot of punches, so was I. And so they cleared, and they made a circle. And then I jumped in and popped him with a left hook, and down he went. Now, we're talking I mean, other yeah. actors were intervening, like Greg Malavey and people like that, right? Yeah, uh, yes. Uh, Les Lanham. Les Lanham. Uh, Irish Les Lanham was there. Glenn Turman was there. And uh, Greg Malavey, I'm pretty sure, was there. But there's some guys that came over after the fight was over. Uh -huh. I think Greg might have been one of those guys. And uh, also Scott Highland, I think, was one of those guys. But the two were standing right there, uh, for sure, it was Greg or uh, not Greg, but uh, Les Lanham and Glenn Turman, and a lot of the stuntmen. Uh, but uh, he was out cold. I knocked him out. He took the. Uh, he was motionless on the ground for the count of ten. 
And then he raised his hand. But he did a very manly thing. He did a very manly thing. It was a week later, and he jumped up, and, uh, and he saw me at breakfast at 5.30 in the morning. It was just getting light outside, and we're waiting to go out on location. And uh, we're all having breakfast there, and there must have been a hundred of us in there. And I see Tim get up on the other side of the room, and he starts walking towards me very fast. And I said, man, this guy is going to sucker punch me. Mm-hmm. He's going to knock me out of my chair. <laughs> 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 and uh, he walked up and did something very manly that I've never quite recovered from. He, he walked up in front of everybody. He said, uh, Jess, he said, I apologize for what I did. And if I were you, I would have done exactly the same thing that you did. And I'm just hoping that we could be friends. Wow. And I stood up and, yeah, I, and I took his hand. And I said, well, let's forget about this thing. And I sit down and have breakfast. And, and we did. And we talked about Jack London, of all things. <laughs> <laughs> and we talked about uh, chess. And then we played some chess. And it turned out that he was a good player. Wow. And then we went out a couple of times. And there's some funny stories I can tell you about that when we went into Denver. But I won't do it now. <laughs> well, we'll <laughs> definitely wait for the next time on that. Man, that sounds like a scene out of Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. I, yeah. I was thinking about the scene between Brad Pitt and the guy that was playing Bruce Lee. I don't know if you saw that or not. But oh, yeah, I yeah. did. I, I saw the movie twice. Oddly, I gave the movie a B plus the first time I saw it. Uh-huh. And the second time I saw it, I gave it an A. I said, wow, this film is better than I remembered. And uh, I, I loved the sequence. The whole Spawn Ranch sequence, I thought, was just... I thought the whole movie. He could have done a three-hour movie just right there at the spawn ranch right. as far yeah. as I was concerned. Yeah. <laughs> I thought it was just so fascinating. And uh, the way these people were so hopeful that he wasn't going to sabotage their way of life and their yeah. existence. <laughs> now, knowing that you hung out on so many movie ranches and stuff, did, did you ever meet Charles Manson? I mean, you know, I've heard a lot of I didn't. I did never, I never met him. As a matter of fact, uh, I got into town one week after... Robert F. Kennedy was assassinated. That was in June. And uh, so uh, I was here. And it was one year later. That was 1968. Mm -hmm. And it was one year later, I think August of 69, that I was over a uh, friend of mine's house by the name of Tom Holland. And and we saw these helicopters flying above this house. And they were there for like all day. And we said, what the hell is going on? And then we learned that uh, that the, the Manson family had had uh, killed uh, mm-hmm. all these people. Mm-hmm. And we, like everybody else in Los Angeles, we were absolutely mortified and stunned by the whole thing. Right. Yeah. It was just something out of, worse than a horror film, you yeah. know? Yeah. Worse yeah. than that. I take it you talk about uh, Tom Holland, the director? Yes. Yeah, a good yes. friend of ours. Great he's guy. a great guy. He's done the show many, many yeah. times. Yeah, he's oh, Tom yeah, Tom's, Tom's a great guy. Yeah. Uh, he... Uh, I didn't see this coming. I met him down at the actor studio because we both started studying there at the same time in, mm-hmm. in the summer of 1968. And uh, he, next thing I knew, he was writing. Mm-hmm. And then he then he wrote a, a movie called Fright Night. Yes. Uh, <laughs> which, uh, man, did that ever take off. And, uh, of course, I went to see it. And I was amazed at this. It, it it caught a very special note that that is so hard to catch, and it's the thing about that film as you're watching it. It's funny, but it's also scary at the same time. Right? Right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it, it's like a roller coaster, which is scary but fun at the same time. You know, right. and uh, uh, so I was kind of amazed by that because I didn't see that in Tom in my conversations with him. You know. I saw quite a bit of him and his wife, Kathy, at the time. And uh, he had a son named Josh at the time. And so uh, uh, I, it just took me by surprise because in knowing him, I didn't see any of that. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, I, when you watch the movie, you say, really? Yeah. Tom? <laughs> Tom Holland? <laughs> well, Tom right, loves so- so let's go let's go backwards just a little bit uh, to kind okay. of where this all began because we know that you're from Tulsa, Oklahoma, right. and you went through the right. military academy and the University right. of Oklahoma. But as far as the acting and stuff, obviously that's something that you shared with your brother. But your parents were not in the business really. Your dad was a, a designer, a designer engineer, and your mom was a tennis champion, right? 
uh, my mother was a tennis champion in, in Tulsa, in Dallas, Texas, in Wichita, Kansas. I think she was Kansas State champion, but I, I'm not going to say that for sure. But I know that she was city champion in those three cities that I named. And my dad, my dad was a, uh, uh, and this for a guy that never graduated from college, he was very dirt poor when he was a kid coming up. Uh, he became president of the second largest company in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Uh, it was behind Boeing, and he's, he was. There was a book dedicated to him, and it's online. It's called the Unit Rig Story. That's the name of the company that he was a uh, president of, and and uh, he designed and sold product all over the world. Uh, so he, here was a guy that was picking cotton when he's 14 years old during the Depression. Mm -hmm. Never had a chance to go to college, and this is this is, you know, people say, oh, the American dream doesn't really exist. Well. You know, I was standing right there watching the whole thing, uh, you know, materialize uh, as I was growing up. And I was watching my dad, who stayed up till 2 o'clock in the morning every night studying, and then he'd get up at 5.30 in the morning to go to uh, start getting ready to go to work. And he rode the bus. Wow. You know? Wow. Yeah. And then, and then he became, you know, quite the guy, very well known, and also a scratch golfer. And he was a uh, champion ski shooter. Well, um, and that's not but, where the, 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 the intellectual side of uh, the Vint family ends either. I mean, you even had a congressman in your family. Yes, uh, my uncle, his brother, my dad's brother, uh, it was Edward Vint. And Edward Vint was a congressman uh, in, in the late 30s. In fact, he uh, dined with uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt at, at the White House. And Roosevelt asked him, he said, how come you're not going for another term? He said, because I can't run around my hand out. He said, I had no idea that that's what a politician did, but now I know. Wow. And it's not for me. He, I'm not that guy. And uh, so he went back to owning his bank there in Dallas, Texas. Wow. But Edward Vint was, uh, I only met him once when I did a dinner theater show there in Dallas, Texas. And what a smart, wonderful uh, I'd say good-looking guy. He looked just like my dad. He was a very good-looking guy. Yeah. And, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, those guys, you know, I hate to say it, but they were a different breed. Yeah. <laughs> and, then, and, then you, and then you, of course, mom and dad's oldest son. Now, you went off to after Studio in L.A. with yeah. your brother, Alan. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. take me, tell me from there, where did we go? Because, actually, that became okay. very influential in what happened later in your career. Well, uh, what happened is that I was studying at Oklahoma University and I was enrolled in business courses like all of my friends and like I was expected to do, uh, but I wasn't interested. They were boring as hell to me. Mm -hmm. I would go to these classes and say, what the hell am I studying this for? I'm not going to be doing this the rest of my life. I'll, I'll last 15 minutes in one of these offices. Are you kidding? <laughs> and I just couldn't focus on it. And uh, finally I said, you know, this isn't going to work. I'm wasting my parents' money. I'm... Uh, you know, I'm going to these Phi Gamma Delta parties all the time, and and uh, great bunch of guys and everything. But I'm I'm just I'm just this isn't working, and so I'm just going to go around the world. <laughs> and so I got as far as New York City, and I I was very shy. I, I couldn't pass a speech class because I would fall apart during the speech out of self consciousness and shyness and. I failed speech three times at Oklahoma University. Wow, you sure can't and, uh, tell that now. <laughs> well, yeah, I know. And uh, so I said, you know, this is something inside of me that i got to get rid of before I go around the world. And so I'm going to study acting in New York, and that way I can fail, and nobody will even know it's me. You know, I can get on the bus and go anywhere, and, uh, you know, I, I'll never see these people again anyway. So what the hell? So I started studying acting, and you know something? I said, man, Wow. Finally, I have found something that I'm in love with. Finally, 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 finally. And uh, uh, so I really started studying not just one school, but then two schools at the same time, then three schools at the same time. And, and uh, then uh, I went to uh, Los Angeles, audition for the actor studio mm -hmm. with my brother, Alan, who came mm -hmm. up from the university. He was studying engineering at the uh, University of Arizona, and he came up, and I asked him to be my partner because I didn't know anybody in Los Angeles. I didn't have a phone number. I had a pregnant wife on a motorcycle, and that was it. So if it wasn't <laughs> and, for you, uh, he'd have been more like dad and been an engineer. Yep. Yeah, yeah. There you go. And, 
And so he auditioned, and they were accepting one in a thousand, according to Strasberg's book. If you go to the first few uh, at the actor studio by Lee Strasberg in the first in the opening, he said we accept one out of a thousand. And so I passed, and uh, uh, Alan passed too. Wow. And we auditioned under different names. I said, Alan, you have to audition under your middle name, Alan Richard, because. I don't want them thinking that they have to take you just because they're taking me. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And, and you know, the thing with the Actors Studio, too, is, is it led to a great partnership. Now, I can totally see you getting along with this guy. One of my favorite interviews I ever did was with Bruce Dern. Okay. And, oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, and you yeah. met Bruce there, and it led to something big yeah. for you with Silent Running. Talk about Bruce. I guess he really liked you, right? Well... I guess so, but he never gave any indication of it while we were down there. But he was very nice to me. Uh, some of the actors that did scenes up there, he would absolutely take them apart, and he would do it with a smile. I mean, I've never <laughs> seen anything like it. I have never seen anything like Bruce, but his comments were always the ones that I would look forward to. Yeah. Uh, he many times would moderate the class, and so uh, at that time, the actor studio was something else. You go down there. And there would be Martin Landau, Shelley Winters, wow. Bruce Dern, uh, uh, Terry Moore. I mean, I could go on and on. And uh, there would be uh, like 40 people. I was just down there recently. You don't see that kind of thing anymore. Yeah. It was just loaded with names and stars and Golden Globe and Academy Award winners and nominees and Diane Ladd and, and Laura, and not Laura at the time. She was very young. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was later. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, the, uh, so it was... Bruce uh, would make comments like this. Uh, there was one comment that he made that I've never forgotten. <laughs> he, he, after the scene was over, and after everybody commented around the room, he said, okay, folks. And he kind of talked like this sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> and he kind of talked in a little hot voice, you know. I, I even did that voice one time uh, in, a, in a part that I was doing. I said, hey, uh, I you know, talking like that. But uh -huh. he said, uh, now, let me tell you people about what you were doing up there on stage. You weren't doing anything. <laughs> it looked like to me that you were bored to death up there, both of you. And we out here in the audience were even more bored than you were. <laughs> <laughs> that was Bruce. Uh, you don't have to feel <laughs> bad Bruce. because, you know, during our interview, this is back in the 90s, he was doing some TV thing for, for Speed Vision called yeah. The Lost Driving or something. He was critiquing right. his daughter, Laura, Laura, and talking about, you know, back in my day, and it's so different now. Now here his daughter's got an Academy Award, yeah. you know, so. Yeah, I know. That's Bruce. Bruce, Bruce is... But let me let me tell you a little bit about Bruce because I know a little bit about him and this type of personality. He is driven so much to become the best at what he does that he becomes an, not just a perfectionist but an ultra perfectionist. Uh -huh. And so that sort of critical thinking and critical mind is exactly what it takes to make a great artist. When Leonardo da Vinci does the uh, David, uh, uh, the, the statue, I mean, he is being hypercritical about yeah. every little tiny detail. And uh, it's the same with Bruce. He's got that same mentality, and he's just as bad with himself. He's just as bad. If Bruce gets down on Bruce, it's all over. You know, I mean, I, this is the kind of guy that can sink into very deep, dark depressions and there won't be anybody around that can rescue him <laughs> except him, you know. I mean, that's the deal with that type of guy, with that type of ultra-perfectionist personality that's very, very bright. Right. You're going to have you're going to have Beethoven. You're going to mm -hmm. have Leonardo. You're going to have people that get down on themselves and go through dark periods that is unreal. You know, and so that's that's the way I see Bruce. I've always seen him like that. What do you think he saw in you? Because you know he really wanted you really bad for Silent Running. There must have been something that he saw that he felt that you fit that part. Well, uh, the first thing I did was with Tina Louise, and we did Cat on the Hot Ten Roof. And I thought it was a uh, she wanted to do it, and she asked me to do it, uh, but I was not. Chance, Chance is Paul Newman. He's a great looking, you know, amazing guy, and uh, I'm not. I, you know, I'm. I'm okay. I can get around, but uh, uh, but I'm not Paul Newman. Paul Newman is a legendary-looking guy. 
And so I always felt a little self-conscious about this. But the second scene we did was with Joan Van Ark, and we did The Respectful Prostitute. And, uh, and from there, my explosive temperament came into play, mm-hmm. unlike no other, which I made a pretty good living on for many years. <laughs> 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 and and uh, uh, so I was able to incorporate that side of myself uh, into that material, and it worked. And, you know, I... I did exactly the same thing when I played Insane Wayne, which is the title character on an 18 episode with George Papard. Mm-hmm. And George Papard used to, we used to uh, uh, have drinks. We'd go down to the Formosa Cafe uh, after the actor studio, and we'd have a couple of drinks, and we'd talk. And now I'm squared off with him. I'm playing Insane Wayne, and I'm ready to take out the 18 <laughs> and, uh, with my explosive personality and pull it up there with a tank and intimidating everybody. But, of course, it's the 18. And eventually, I hit the desk. So I could, I could see you getting along with George, but you know, what about you and Mr. T? Okay, <laughs> uh, I didn't talk to him. Probably good that I didn't. Uh, you know, <laughs> the reason I didn't talk to him, and I'll tell you why, because he was selling his autograph to children. Yeah, for twenty bucks. Yeah. And he said, "If you want my autograph, you got to pay me twenty. This is like a ten-year-old kid. Because he felt that they're going to turn around and sell it somewhere else for more, and so and yet there was no eBay back did. then either. There was no eBay. What was he worried about? <laughs> yeah. So you know, I I just uh, I I had I was not enamored with him. Yeah. Right. And so I never stuck my hand out and introduced myself. Right. Wow. Um, because of that. <laughs> Because well, of that. Well, you know, the thing with Silent Running was such a classic film, and Douglas Trumbull... Which, who did, that was his first directing thing. Yeah, and yeah. did the effects for 2001 and everything. The thing that must have hit you, I've talked to people who's been on movies that caliber before, is, is the sets, uh, the ship and everything. It was so incredible. I mean, did it look that good in person? Oh, uh, that's a very good question, sir. That's a good question, because I'm not just seeing the set that we're shooting, I'm seeing everything behind it. Yeah, uh, that's I true. thought it was very clever uh, what, what he... Uh, decided to do and that was uh, we shot it on the interior of a battleship down in Long Beach and uh, you know of course they they moved in with a set and did everything that they had to do to bring it up to what a spaceship looks like but they incorporated the battleship all the pipes and the grayness and all that other stuff in the hallways and the tight hallways so it was a uh, it was really brilliant actually Uh, but uh, Douglas was a very quiet apple pie kind of guy with these rosy shiny cheeks <laughs> you know and uh he was uh uh and bruce uh, took me in um i had this call uh, they said yes you're supposed to go to canoga park uh, for to read for something i said okay and so i i said canoga park and they said yeah now at the time canoga park was i had to look it up on a map you know and uh so i drove out there as an airplane hangar so I walked inside, and Bruce is there, and he says, Jess, I want you to meet these guys, and he said, you're in here for an astronaut, and da 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 and I said, okay, and, he, and so he walks right up to Mike Gruskoff, the producer, he said, this is Jesse Vent, he's from the actor's studio, he works exactly the same way I do, mm-hmm. and so because of that, I'd like to have him on the phone, and he said, and then he said this additional thing, which I'll never forget, he said, I'm the star of this film. <laughs> And as the star, I'm entitled to one request. And that request is that Jess work on this film. Wow. Oh, wow. But, yeah. Yeah, because he had seen me in some, you know, scenes at the actor studio. The one with Joan Van Ark, the one with Tina Louise, and another one after that with Joan Van Ark called Rabbit Run, directed by Jerry O'Laughlin. And uh, uh, so he was confident that I could, I could do it. Uh, but uh, the, the part, but I still am very unsatisfied with my performance of that very much so it was a, a great just, recommendation though because i remember when bruce talked to me about silent running because that was his chance to show he could carry a movie right that was his breakout oh. role and, and to take you along oh. with him like bruce really should have won an academy award he's been nominated but i don't know why he never won he really is incredible and to know that he admired you like that it's great well you know i think See, usually Bruce had played bad characters. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I think coming over to being a sympathetic character was, was not easy for the audience to digest at first, even though everybody agrees that Bruce is an amazing actor. Uh, you know, and uh, everybody learns from watching Bruce. I don't care who you are. Yeah. Right. They all respect Bruce's uh, talent and his, 
his acting ability and his insight into acting and his dedication is, you know, unequal to uh, anybody's that I've ever been around. And that's all he thinks about, and that's all he wants to talk about. And if he changes subject, you're his enemy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, let's talk, about, let's talk about the runaway hit that I think everybody was surprised that it became such a huge hit, but I don't know why it was such a great film. And that was a little <laughs> film at the time uh, yeah. that was helmed by Max Baer Jr. Now, let me, let me guess. You get the script, and you're told it's written by Jethro Bodine. <laughs> and, and you're thinking, okay. He, okay, this is cute. Jethro Bodine wrote a film, <laughs> actually Max Baer. But, of but, course, we're talking about Macon County Line. But it was great. Okay, I'm going to tell you the story that you've never heard, but you're going to love it. Okay. Okay. You're going to love it because you've never read this anywhere. Okay. I can tell you. Absolutely. Take your uh, time. I want, I want to tell you exactly what happened. I'm not a fan of Max Bears. Okay. Just the opposite. Um, so that you can take into account with whatever I say. Mm-hmm. Max Bear was hired to do a film after the Beverly Hillbillies was canceled. It's called Redneck America. And he was shooting it in one of the southern states when it collapsed financially. Now, he was heartbroken about this because... Uh, this gave him a chance to play something other than the Stooge that yeah. he's been right. so well known for. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, so he, what he did is he brought that script, Redneck America, back, and he changed the names of the towns to the names of the characters. And he hired a writer, director, by the name of Richard Compton, who's a brilliant guy, who's a wonderful guy. He, he passed away, I think, about 10 years ago. And uh, Richard... Richard was exactly the right choice for several reasons. Uh, but they just revamped a script that Max had stolen. Max put his name on there as a writer. Mm. He got away with it. He got sued for that. He got sued for that. But according to Max, according to Max, the judge was a big fan of his father, as the late Max Bear Sr., heavyweight champion of the world, yeah. and knocked out the Nazi in <clears throat> 1933. And uh, so... So maybe this is the judge's way of saying thanks. <laughs> but Max, but but uh, so that's what happened with the script. Okay. Now uh, with Richard Compton, uh, he he, and I'm not saying this just because Al and I read it, but all the characters that he cast in there went on to be really have huge careers, like uh, Timothy Scott and Jim Gammon and and uh, some of the others, and uh, Jeffrey Lewis. He those guys weren't working at the time. And Richard Compton, as a director, just had an eye for talent that was pretty amazing. And he fought for me and Alan. Alan was already doing, going to do the part mm-hmm. uh, because uh, he had done such a wonderful job in Panic and Needle Park. He had second billing in that behind Al Pacino, and he got great reviews. And so they just handed the part in Making County Line. Then they heard that he had a brother that was an actor. So, so instead of just having two guys... Richard came up with the idea said, why don't we make it brothers and bring in Jesse Venton? Why not? Because they're and really so brothers. I came in, and Max Bear and Roger Cameron, the producer, said, if that guy does the part, his reading was so terrible, we will pull our money right now. Oh. And Richard Compton talked them into watching me do a screen test. So I did a screen test, and, and Richard Compton was smart enough. Here's what he did. He's smart enough to say, okay, Jess, you pretty much got the part, but we've got to test the girl. Would you help us out? And if he had told me, Jess, those guys don't like you. They think you stink. <laughs> now we're going to do a screen test. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> well, I, would, yeah. I would have curled up like a spider on yeah. a hot stove if he had told me that. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but uh, he was smart enough you know, to disguise what we're doing. And so after they saw it, they said, oh, my God, this guy is you know, he, perfect for the part. So Alan and I went on the road doing this part and uh, we had quite the time as brothers uh, you know uh, internalizing our childhood and our teenage years and you know our times as brothers uh, doing that and and we just had pretty much a great time pretty but, much of a great time you know, I'm, I'm really not, hit. not really surprised to hear about any shenanigans with with Max Bear we got the, the strangest email you, you being on radio and stuff you crazy stuff email or whatever anyway but we had Max Bear on the show and we got uh-huh. a, a letter from some actress the Jeffrey Epstein thing was starting the trial and all that right and right. and right. she right. had complained 
that we had Max Bear on the show. She thought she was talking to Max. I guess she thought we were Max or whatever. He was just a guest, you know. And she was complaining yeah. about how he had taken advantage of her when she was an underage actress. Well, you know something? I know for a fact. I know for a fact. Uh, first of all, it's on the record that he uh, uh, hit Victoria Principal in the face on Sunset Boulevard. That's on the record. Mm-hmm. What's not on the record, I haven't been able to find it, but he told me that he threw his wife, Joanne, through a plate glass window. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, she sued him from the hospital bed. And he didn't have much money at the time, but he did have residuals coming in for Beverly Hillbillies, which had been just canceled. Mm-hmm. And uh, so she got the, the uh, all the residuals from the Beverly Hillbillies awarded to her by the court and he got nothing which left him broke yeah. and nobody would hire him and uh, uh, another instance uh, I know for a fact because she said it in front of an audience of 300 Cheryl Waters who started making County Line mm-hmm. she said she was not going to get nude and go in the hot tub and Max doubled up her fist uh, doubled up his fist and threatened her oh. Oh if you don't God. get in there you're going to get punched in the face she said that in front of an audience of 300 people Wow. At a question and answer period. I didn't know about it. I didn't know about it. I just learned about it that night. And I can tell you some other stuff. He broke a girl's arm. He's driving right along in a Porsche. She had an affair with uh, uh, one of his actors on the set of uh, Ode to Billy Joe. Uh-huh. And he was pounding her. She was holding up her left arm as a shield, and it snapped. It wouldn't have been Glennis and O'Connor, would it? Because she was on the show, too. Who? Glennis O'Connor, perhaps? From Ode to Billy Joe. Uh, oh, uh, Glenn O'Connor from Ode to Billy Joe. Yeah, I saw the movie. I, I've never met her. Don't know her. Uh, but uh, she's not Max's type, so okay. she was probably safe. Yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's just too bad because you can show, like, with you, you can be a tough guy on screen and a decent guy in person. You don't have to be like that. I mean, it's too bad, you know. Well, uh, I, you know, I never, I, I, uh, I can say a lot of things now. And I don't care if he sues me. Uh, because uh, I know his history, and it's a thousand times worse than I've told you right here on the on this interview. I don't care who knows it. Uh, he's uh, you know he, he needs a lot of help. That guy. Yeah. Well, one thing about uh, the movie is it had a great director. The the one scene you talked about, yes. the, the hot tub scene with your brother yeah. Alan, that yeah. was it, it was poetic. Yeah. I, I mean the the I synchronization, you know, the, the whole movement and everything. It was, it was like ballet. I mean, was that really yeah. hard for your brother to do that scene? Well, I'm not so sure. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I really didn't talk to him about it. He seemed to me to be pretty much at ease. They told me to remove my underwear at one point. It was the beginning of the film. I said no. I shut down the film for about 30 minutes while, uh, you know, they were saying, you know, and I said, look, it's not in the script. I'm not going to. Nobody's going to pay one. There's not going to be one extra ticket sold in the world because Jesse Vince butt is not in the movie, <laughs> and, and I'm not going to take my pants off. Yeah, I, I did it. notice that, Jesse. Your, your brother showed his butt, but you didn't show your butt, okay? I did not. <laughs> I, I, I did not. You know, I did not. And, and it makes no sense. First of all, you know, it's it's ugly as hell. Nobody wants to see it. And, uh, you know, it would just hurt the box up. It wouldn't help it. I don't know what these guys were thinking. Uh, but it... It, they weren't. They weren't even close to winning that argument. I yeah. can tell you that right now. So were you, you know? surprised that it was such a hit? God, it was a huge hit. Oh yeah, I was. I was. As a matter of fact, I was totally wrong about it, and I was wrong about Silent Running too. Yeah. I I was completely wrong about Silent Running. When, when we're shooting the film, I'm looking at this film and say, "Now wait a minute." Four actors in the movie. Three of them get killed within the first thirty minutes. <laughs> That leaves Bruce talking to a robot for an hour? What the fuck is he talking about? <laughs> what do they have in common? You know? Yeah, and inside, and, uh, inside those said, robot who suits. In the hell's gonna wa- who in the hell's going to watch this film? It's going to play on Saturday morning for children. <laughs> anyway. And inside those robot so suits were disgruntled little actors, because I'm sure that they were quite yes. uncomfortable. Wow. Well, well, what they were uh, was, I didn't realize it, they were amputees who, yeah. whose legs had been uh, cut off, and uh, they were uh, the sweetest, friendliest people that you could possibly imagine, you know, and it was, uh, they just, they were part of the landscape there on the, on the boat, and, and the shooting the movie, and, and uh, we just had a great time. Well, you know, one of the highest compliments that an actor can get is to have the respect and the esteem of other people in the industry, and that's definitely the case with you 
I know that even uh, who now, I mean, everything he touches these days seems to turn to gold, but Quentin Tarantino is a big fan of you and your brother, and he had even talked about uh, one of your films that he loved, and this truly was your film, and that's Black Oak Conspiracy. Yeah, and uh, thank you for mentioning that. Black Oak Conspiracy was a film that I produced and starred in and, and uh, wrote. And uh, it, it uh, played all over the world and got really good reviews everywhere. And I don't think it had a single bad review. And uh, Quentin Tarantino was the in a Facebook post that was uh, uh, intended for a friend of mine, uh, Jack Lucarelli. Uh, it, uh, uh, he goes on and on about this. He goes on and on saying, I'm a fan of Event Brothers, and uh, I loved Bacon County Line. I loved uh, Black Oak Conspiracy. He said, I drove to the theater to see it when it came out. And so... Uh, these kinds, of, uh, you know, I've never met Quentin Tarantino, but I hope to someday, and so I can thank him for the nice things that he said about me and Alan. And he did play the movie, Making County Line, at his uh, at his uh, new theater that he bought in mm -hmm. Los Angeles on Beverly Boulevard. Right. It's called The New Beverly. Right. And he, he played that uh, movie last year. I wouldn't be surprised if you hear from him one of these days. You'll be in one of his films. I'm just, I'm sure of it. I really am. Well, I hope so. That would be fun. Uh um, you know he's a, he's a great director I, uh, and, and a writer. I love his writing. I love his writing in Pulp Fiction. I, I was one of the guys that early guys that read the script, and uh, I was just astonished. I, cause I I didn't know who he was. I, I kept looking at the. I said Tarantino. Who in the hell is that? You, you know when Brad Pitt Everybody, got the hey, Oscar uh, for Once Upon a huh? Time in Hollywood, they refer to Brad Pitt character in that movie is being easy breezy and it really that reminded me of your character in Black Oak Conspiracy that you were kind of like the laid back uh, Han Solo kind of I'm cool but you know not <laughs> you, so, how do you do that I mean is that something comes natural to you or well uh, that, that comes from my long study at the actor studio yeah uh, which is to try to forget that you're acting and try to be as truthful and organically truthful as you possibly can and uh, don't worry about performing or any of these things that people aren't interested in that they really want to see uh, the the insides of the character you know and uh, uh, so yeah um, uh, all I can tell you is that Tarantino I, oh by the way I <laughs> I finally figured out who Tarantino was when, when I was reading that script I said this is so amazing he was the same guy that wrote True Romance I called my agent I said man this guy's a liar who in the hell is this guy really? he said well I... he wrote the movie True Romance okay oh. and I said and I said True Romance oh my god that was that was a great film yeah and uh, so uh, you know I continued to read it and uh, so there's a, there's another story behind this but I'm not going to tell it now okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, t tell us, though, about uh, with Black Oak Conspiracy. I mean, you had been an actor. Uh, how did you decide to sit down and, and write the story for this? And, and you were producer on and everything else. How was that experience different um, it, it, versus everything else you had done up to that point? Well, my dad, my dad was, uh, uh, I've already told you, the car just started up next to me. I'm, I'm sitting in my car. Oh. Oh, by the way. Okay. It, that way I don't have any interference from uh, other people right uh, but uh, uh, the uh, oh where was I as far as how Black Oak Conspiracy the, yes yes Black Oak Conspiracy uh, do the whole thing yourself is it, yeah. is it very distracting no no you're fine okay uh, Black Oak Conspiracy came about uh, because I was thinking in terms of my dad, and uh, he manufactured the largest mining truck in the world that he had uh, designed, mm -hmm. and uh, and so I I went out to a mining a pit mining operation one time with my dad, and I saw this, and I thought you know there's a story here, and uh, so I came up with a story that involved. Uh, the, the pit mining and a, and a scheme within the town, a small town, uh, to uh, bilk a lot of elderly people out of their money. Right. And that the stuntman returns to the hometown. And uh, he finds out about this because of, of his mother's death. And then he goes up against not one person or two people or three, but the entire town. The whole thing unravels, and as it turns out, the whole town's involved. You know, so 
uh, so it, be, it became quite the drama, and uh, uh, well, the critics really loved it. And I frankly, I liked it too, and I'm glad that Tarantino liked it. Well, one of my favorite parts was was when the girl and the guy decided to do it in a cop car. And the, the, the kids like me. That's the way I was. I was all fumbly around girls, and she got disgusted and just ripped her own, ripped her own brows, blouse off. I mean, that was that that was me. That just totally my life right yeah. there. But well, that was uh, that always brought a lot of laughs. Never failed. Every once yeah. in a while, if I saw the movie playing somewhere, I'd go down in the evening. I, I'd slip in in the back of the theater, and, and every time that scene came up, uh, people would just howl. They just thought that was the funniest scene. And so, yeah, it was a lot of fun. And I got to tell you one quick thing. Yes. Uh, it just popped into my brain here. Something I had to be. After making County Line, it was released, and it was a big hit. And I was walking around the streets hoping that somebody was going to recognize me. <laughs> so nobody was recognizing me. <laughs> <laughs> and so I said, I just wonder what it's like to be famous, where a total stranger walks up and says, Hey, you know, aren't you an actor? Didn't I see you in this movie? I just want to know that experience. I'm yeah. dying for it, in fact. So finally, I just said, I, you know, I'm going to just go across. I'm going to go where the movie's playing. And then I'm going to go across the street and sit in the coffee shop and wait for everybody to empty out of the movie theater when it's <laughs> over. And they'll sit around me and they'll, they'll say, hey, isn't that the guy that we just saw? Yeah. <laughs> And so I did that. And I was sitting in a coffee shop. Everybody walks out of the movie. They come over and they sit down in the coffee shop all around me. Nobody says a goddamn thing. <laughs> Not one thing. <laughs> and I wanted to yell out, I'm in the movie, it's me! <laughs> Except you're over in Malaysia somewhere and they're like, oh, it's Jesse Lynn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's true too. You know, that's true. In, in Malaysia or other, other places, uh, I would get recognized immediately. But That's crazy. There's another thing that popped in my head. i got to tell you, about this recognition thing, sometimes I'm confused with other people. I was up at Tahoe skiing with a, uh, a beautiful girl. And so at night, we decided to go down to this uh, restaurant and have dinner and a couple of drinks. And mm -hmm. I walk in and her table and, and uh, you know, uh, order a couple of drinks. And, and the guy walks over, introduces himself. He says, I'm the manager here. And I just want to tell you, that I think you're a wonderful actor. I said, well, thank you, sir. And uh, this wasn't like, uh, you know, in 75 or 76, and Macon had been released, silent running, a little big man, some of the other ones. And uh, so I said, thank you very much, sir. He said, I just, I just, you know, uh, and here I'd had a steak dinner, and, I'd, and I don't know how many drinks we had, but he said, I just want you to know that uh, the dinner's on me. Wow. The drinks are on me. And uh, I said, thank you so much. Thank you very much. And he comes back about 15 minutes later. He said, would you please sign this? And, please. I said, all right. And so he sits down next to me, and he said, the movie that I really loved you in was Easy Rider. Mm. Oh, he thought you were Peter oh, Fonda. God, this guy thinks I'm Dennis Hopper. Or Dennis Hopper. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> this guy thinks I'm Dennis Hopper. <laughs> now, what do I do here? Wow. Do I sign Dennis Hopper's name so I won't get out of paying this $200 bill that I just ran up? <laughs> If you would have asked I didn't Dennis, really didn't know what to do. if you would have asked Dennis, Dennis, he Hopper. probably if you would have asked Dennis, he probably would have said, "Hell yeah, you signed Dennis Hopper's name, so you get out of paying that bill." Well, <laughs> uh, you know what I did was I scribbled it where it was just non legible. You couldn't even tell what it was. I just made a big scribble in there, and he looked at it and he looked at me and said, "Thank you." <laughs> My, my favorite story is Elvis Presley used to always sign, sincerely, Elvis Presley. So a fan one day met him at the gates. He used to go back in the old days out to the gates to meet the fans. And they, they would be like, well, you're always writing sincerely, Elvis Presley. So he's like, okay. So he took the autograph. He wrote, fuck you, Elvis Presley. So, oh, my God. <laughs> there, there you go. you got to be crazy. Well, at least, they didn't oh think that, at least they didn't think you were uh, somebody that you knew real well. Uh, which I can kind of see a comparison, not in looks, but in style and acting. That's David Carradine. Uh, David Carradine was a really good friend of mine. And uh, he, uh, we didn't start out that way, by the way. But, uh, but later we became very good friends. I did three movies with him. And uh, I was over at his house in 2004 uh, for his New Year's. That's the last time I saw him. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, he wrote two books. And he mentioned me in both of them. Wow. Uh, one was Endless Highway, talked about me in there, and and then Kill Bill, uh, The Diary, and it's about the Quentin Tarantino's filming process, and his Bar None, the best book 
about film acting that's ever been written. If you want to know what it's like to be on a movie with the greats, then that's it. That's the book. Right. Kill Bill by David Carradine. Well, you've written some books uh, yourself, too. I mean, we want to mention your book. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and they've gotten good re not good reviews. Some of them have been great. As a mm -hmm. matter of fact, I'll tell you, if the sales were as good as the reviews, I'd be a mega millionaire. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but the reviews have really been excellent. One is about William the Conqueror versus King Harold. Mm -hmm. That's on Amazon. And then there's a Western called the Reno Brothers. And that's on Amazon, too. And both have uh, excellent, excellent, excellent reviews, except for there's two reviews from Portland, Oregon, uh, uh, a couple of trolls up there who I made enemies with, and I know who they are. Oh, hometown they, people. They ri ripped my review. Yeah, yeah. somebody whose girlfriend uh, I took away from them. <laughs> oh, my They've God. never forgiven me. Oh. Yeah. They say, I'll get this guy, and they gave me a one-star review. It's all. It's got five star reviews all the way down the line. It's got then pops up a one star, and this guy says the worst book I've ever read in my life. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I love the picture of you on Facebook where you were at a party and there was Laura Dern and her mom and, and Bo was there oh, and yeah. other people. Uh, yeah. You, you know, we had Bo on and he talked about David Carradine. And he said that David Carradine was, was not the martial artist you thought he was. I mean, how did you feel about that? I mean, did you think that David Carradine oh, was... Oh, well, I, I, I think David was an athletic guy. He had no fear. I can tell you that right now. David had no fear. Uh, uh, I was, uh, as an example, it started out where, you know, I mean, I've already told you about the Timothy Dalton story. Mm -hmm. And I'm a little bit of a hothead. Um, if... Uh, I had gotten a fight with David Carradine, then I'm going to get fired, and that's all there is to it, and he's going to, he's not. Yeah. It doesn't matter what it's for. And so I stayed away from him because I was afraid that, that, you know, we were going to get into it because of his reputation and my reputation. And and so then we were shooting one day. The first shot, we hadn't even introduced ourselves to each other. We hadn't even looked at each other. And we're standing face-to-face -face now, waiting for the sun to come out. It's behind the clouds. And then it comes out, and then we start the scene. Then it gets shady again. They say, "Oh, you gotta, we gotta wait here." So it's very awkward. David and I have not introduced ourselves. <laughs> I'm playing the world champion motorcycle rider. He is the challenger. He's my head rival, and we're rivaling each other right there on the set, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, but he started talking, and the next thing I know, I'm really totally captured by what he's saying. Yeah. It's not just philosophical it's also very scientific he was a very in-depth thinker and talker and i and afterwards after the scene he said you want to get a beer i said sure and we walked over there and i listened to this guy talk and after that i said to myself you know that's the last time that i'm ever going to prejudge somebody i thought he was like me and that we're going to get a fight and this guy turned out to be the most wonderful bright intelligent guy uh, imaginable, and so I immediately bought his book online in the highway, mm -hmm. read that, and had even more respect for him. And uh, now we just w we were just friends over the years, and and then he always said nice things about me in his books, and and uh, he was one of a kind. Uh, I don't believe the story of how he died. I, I don't either. Really no. well, uh, and you know what I think it was very quickly. I just think that that uh, Thailand had a lot of incoming films that were bringing in millions of dollars. Yeah. And uh, so I think what they sometimes do is thugs will grab an actor and try to squeeze him for a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that's what happened, and he, he wouldn't give in. And Thailand uh, wouldn't uh, uh, come forward about that, and they said that it was a suicide. Yeah. Or something like that. That's a little death or something. But, so I don't believe their version at all. I believe, I believe that... Uh, people had kidnapped him or was holding their hostage and trying to squeeze him for his bank account. That's what I think. Well, we never met David. We know his whole family. We know his daughter and we know his granddaughter personally. Yeah. And, and that whole family, yeah. no, nobody believes that, that he no, no. did, even by accident. Nobody believes that. Okay, nobody. Know. I was around him. I never saw or heard. You know, if you're around somebody for a very long, you sort of get a sense of, of who they are. And this was diametrically opposed to everything that I ever knew about him. Uh, I knew Keith. I worked with Keith in 1974 on, yeah. a, on a film called the, the Three Godchilds, or The Three Godfathers. 
in Western with Jack Clance, and uh, and uh, I worked with I, I didn't ever work with Bobby, but I had lunch with him just recently, about three weeks ago, uh, with him and Rob Word, mm -hmm. and uh, at the El Coyote there in Beverly, and it, he's also a wonderful guy. Yeah, he is. It's a wonderful family, and. You know something? If you read Endless Highway, this is the great thing about it. You, you think that, you know, David was born with a silver spoon in his mouth and a pathway, a direct pathway into stardom because he's a charity. But read that book. <laughs> no, I, I don't believe that at all. But you're right because I, I know yeah. his daughter, Kalisto, who's been at my house several times, she yeah. kept asking her dad for roles or asking her dad for money, and he'd look at her and say, get a fucking job. Yeah. You know, he didn't help. Yeah. He didn't yeah. help his kids. Yeah. And I don't yeah, that's it. it. And, and John Carradine didn't help his kids. Right. John Carradine was, a, a, you know, a terrific guy and a terrific actor, but he had kids all over the place. He had several different wives, and, and, and so Keith is the half-brother of David, and David is the half-brother of Robert. Robert is the half-brother of Michael Bowen, who I've also worked with. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, those guys earned everything that they have. Mm -hmm. They earned it themselves. They didn't get through the door by being named Charity, yeah. you know, and I, I was wrong about him. I thought that was the deal, but I was one thousand percent wrong. Well, I wasn't surprised to see you were hanging out with Bo Hopkins because you Bo guys yeah. must have been some real <laughs> yeah, shit Bo kickers together. I'll tell you, that ripped the town up. I can just imagine it. <laughs> oh my God! Uh, oh no, Bo and I've got a few stories. I can tell you that right now. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> oh God. Yeah, there, there's one guy I've got to ask you about. Him, I can't tell him on the radio. Right? Oh, okay, well we'll, well, we'll get you over here next time you're in the Los Angeles area, and, and we'll we'll get a few beers or whatever, and we'll get you to spill it out. But but one person I wanted to ask you, I could, I don't know, it could go either way, whether you got along with this guy or not. Uh, Bobby Joe and the Outlaw, Marjo Gortner. Okay, we we had Linda uh, Belinda Blasky on. She wasn't too fond of Linda Carter, but she said that Marjo was, was a real kind of down home, good old boy, like I like to say. Did you get along good with Marjo? I did. Uh, I liked Marjo. I got along with him really well, uh, and uh, we were friends uh, while we were on the set. And then afterwards, he lived up in in Laurel Canyon, and he was. Uh, not always having parties, but he would have parties there from time to time in his house, and, and I was always invited, and uh, I knew both of his girlfriends at the time, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, he, he was a friend, uh, yeah. and Marjo was a very, uh, very interesting guy. Uh, I think, I tell you what, I think he could have been five times the actor that he was, but he sort of felt... He sort of took the attitude that he'd been in front of people, public speaking, for such a long time, that acting was the same thing. Yeah, he did that right. whole religious thing when he was right. a kid. He was that, that preacher. Yeah, and, and so he just sort of just sort of transferred one skill into another, but it's not the same thing. Yeah. There's yeah. a thing called internalizing where you organically live the part, and I think he could have been much better, much, much better than he was. Uh, because I think he had the talent and the brain, but he wouldn't, for some reason, he just didn't believe that there was more to it <laughs> yeah. than what he was doing. But if he played the part of a preacher, of course, it was perfect, yeah, yeah. which he did frequently, frequently did that. And I got along with him, uh, you know, well. Uh, Linda, you know, I barely saw from, one, from time to time. I had no problem with her. I got a funny story that I can tell Go ahead, uh, about can. Linda. Yeah, but uh, do what? Yeah, go ahead. Tell if you can. Uh, I guess you can edit a lot of this stuff out, right? Well, we're uncensored, but but you you're free to say anything uh, okay. you want to say. We're totally uncensored. All right. Okay. I'll tell you one quick story. Okay. I hope it's quick. Uh, I was at I I was a little bit of a womanizer during it was 1975, and uh, uh, that included being on the set. And, on, you know, all around Albuquerque, and I just had a lot of girlfriends mm -hmm. when I was there, and I wasn't paying any attention to Linda Carter purposely mm -hmm. because I knew her ego was massive. You couldn't stick that ego of hers inside the Goodyear blimp. That, 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 that's exactly what Belinda Belaski told us. Yeah, <laughs> it, and uh, I mean, it was huge. It was huge, and uh, uh, so this kind of woman has never really attracted to me because there's so there's so much maintenance there's so much 
you know, uh, everything's an issue, everything is a debate, everything is navigating and negotiating and all this, you know, by the time I go through all that stuff, I'm too tired to have sex, you know? Right. <laughs> and uh, so, so I just, uh, uh, I sort of avoided her. Now, she comes to me after one week. She crosses her arm, stares straight at me, says, I know your game, Vent. She called me Vent. Mm -hmm. I know your game, Vent. I said, what's my game, Linda? She said, your game is to play hard to get. You're purposely ignoring me. I said, well, <laughs> I said, Linda, <laughs> I, you know, I'm, as you noticed, if I was interested in you, I wouldn't be running around with all these girls that I'm set here. She said, oh, you're just holding out, holding out. You know why? <laughs> I said, why? She said, it'll make it more dramatic that way. Mm. And I knew, I knew what she was doing. She had zero interest in me. Zero. The only interest she had in me was the fact that I was ignoring her. Right. That was driving her nuts. And right. I knew it was. I knew it was driving her nuts. So, one night, about 11.30 at night, I had my car in the set. And uh, the director, Mark Lester, says, Okay, Vet, that's a wrap. You can go home now. I said, Great. And I'm walking to my car. She said, Hey, Jeff, I'm, I'm wrapped too. Can I ride into town with you? We all stay at the same hotel. I said, Sure. And uh, so she gets in the car. And she said, do you play backgammon? I said, no, I don't play backgammon. That's got dice to it, right? She said, yeah. I said, well, it's all luck. I said, I play chess. There's no luck in that. There's no spinning wheels or there's no cards and, no, you know, that kind of crap. Right. Dice. And she says, well, come on up, sir. I'll teach you how to do it. I said, okay, cool. And I said, hmm, this is the big one here. <laughs> <laughs> she lays down in the bed and puts out the bat game and says, here's what you do. You know, you take the dice, you roll them here and do this. And I said, okay. She says, excuse me, I'll be right back. And so she comes back a minute later. Now she's in her bath bathrobe with no bra. And she's, you know, she's looking very, very sensual. She's looking very there. Wonder Woman, <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. And so I said, I said, I just know what's going to happen here. I'm going to try to kiss her here in just a minute, and she's going to say no. But I've got to do it anyway. So after a game where I won, I said, what kind of game is it that the student beats the teacher in the first game? What kind of <laughs> game is this? It's crap. I said, but anyway, let's get to the point. And I leaned across the table, the, the back of the table, to kiss her, and she yanked her head back. She says, oh, 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 no, you don't, Mr. Vent. Oh, <laughs> oh, no, you don't. I'm not going to be one of your girls around here on the set. I'm not going to. I said, okay, okay, Linda. All right. I stepped right into this one. I fell right into this trap. I knew it was a trap. I was going to fall into it. But, you know, I don't care. It's okay. Yeah. And, I, you know, I think she wanted me to stay there and argue with her and negotiate and all that stuff. But by that time, I don't feel sexy. Right. You know, yeah. right. by the time I have to use my mentality to figure everything out, then it, you know, I'm not thinking, you know, anywhere. Yeah. So I said, look, I'll see you tomorrow. She said, okay, that's fine. Yeah, no. We we parted friends and we were friends throughout the set. And that's the only thing that happened. But I thought it was funny. Well, you know, I, when, I, when you're, you're like shunned like that and she plays game, not even the lasso of truth. <laughs> could make could make you want to <laughs> rise to the occasion yeah, as we say. I just sure. stepped right into the trap. Is wow. what I did. I knew it was a trap. I the funny thing is, I knew it was a trap. Yeah. And I said, here I go, and I stepped right into it anyway. I knew it. Right. But well, anyway. as we as we end this, we did tease the audience with telling people that you actually created your own beer. No, that 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 was a little bit of a mistake. Now oh, here's okay. what I did. Uh, I took a beer, uh, a lager beer. A famous lager beer. Yeah. And then I took another beer that I very much liked that was a very European beer. I can't tell you what it was. I'm right. afraid I might get sued. But I put about 15% and then 20% in there. And it gave it a unique flavor. But it still had the kind of, like, Coors, like, a, or Bud or Miller. You know, people go to the NASCAR races and they take cases of that stuff with them, you know? Mm -hmm. And you can drink a lot of it, whereas you take a dark beer or like a Guinness, you can only drink maybe two or three. And and uh, so uh, I said, you know, I, I want to develop a, a, a lager with a little bit of a hint of this, a little bit of a hint of that. And so I had a tasting 
uh, uh, experiment with 40 people and it won number one against four, four very popular beers. And so I had a guy from Coors call me. And uh, when I put it out there on the internet, and he said, we distribute Blue Moon also, which is, uh, you know, a, a subsidiary kind of thing, and on and on. And I thought this guy was going to do something with the bear, but he never did. And I never did either. Mm-hmm. I sort of just kind of let it go. And I started traveling around and doing things and goofing off. But it was a lot of fun to go through that for a while. And I had these bottles all over town, all over Portland, Oregon, giving them to my friends, going out in the canoes. We'd had canoe trips up there in Portland, Oregon. And I uh, organized these with my uh, acting class and all my friends. And we'd have 40 people going down in about 20 canoes, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, so it was always a lot of fun. We did that frequently too. We well, we did that all the time. You you have to admit, I mean, uh, Jesse Lee Vint the Third has had a pretty amazing life. You've backpacked all over the world. You're a voting member of the Academy of Motion Pictures Arts and Sciences. You're a celebrity chess champion. You've been in all of these films that are fondly remembered. What haven't you done that you wish you had, if anything? Oh, gosh, <sighs> poor. Well, there's a couple of things that I missed as a director. I can't talk about it really uh, that I that I wish I had done, mm-hmm. and uh, I didn't. And I wish I had done, and <clears throat> that. But everything else is it's pretty. It's been a very full and very eventful life. Yeah. And uh, there's some things I regret. I regret doing business with Max Bear Jr. Mm-hmm. For one, that's my biggest regret that I have. Uh, to, to tell you honestly. But the rest of it has been really good. and uh, You did get to meet I, your hero, John Wayne. Did what? You did get to meet your hero, John Wayne. Oh, I did. Yeah, yeah that, was quite the, that was quite the experience, too. I still remember. And I, I met Clint, Clint Eastwood, and uh, uh, that was quite an experience. And just the people that I met, you know, and when I show up for work, and there's this guy and that person that you've seen throughout your lifetime, and, he, and now you're shaking hands with him and getting ready to go to work, and... And it's not the kind of work uh, where it's a nine to five in a cubicle, uh, right. where I I would have you know committed suicide if I had to go through that. Uh, it's it's the kind of thing where like if you wake up on Centennial, it's like waking up at a Frederick Remington painting every morning right. and saying, "Wow, you know." So and, this and, is what the day is going to be like, huh? And, and you know what's <laughs> cool too is from all over the United States of America, right. and uh, the biggest long story hit. Uh, heard ever assembled in the United States was for that movie, Centennial. Yeah. And, and you know what's cool too is one of the movies, of course, you're really known for is Making County Line, and, and to know that you shared that with your brother Alan. I, I mean, wow, you know? Yeah, yeah. You, you don't get yeah. that too often, stuff like that. I mean, <laughs> brothers well, as I brothers. Well, fr- I, I had a great group of friends in high school that they always wondered what I was going to do with my life too, as I did. And then they would write me and say, "Well, we." <laughs> Mm-hmm. So funny. They'd say, we were driving down <laughs> the 51st Street uh, bypass, and we look up at the uh, drive in movie, and there's Jesse Vince's face on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> the, biggest, the biggest troublemaker in all of Tulsa, Oklahoma. Yeah, I yeah. got a feeling you and your brother were pretty much in person like what we saw in Macon County. <laughs> uh, you know, right yeah. on down with the naked asses in the air and the jumping in the car and, and the whole, whole nine yeah. yards. The, the only well, one we haven't. Falling outside the car, remember? I don't know if you remember when yes. I fell outside of the car and then got back in uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. uh, as they were pulling out of the parking lot. Well, I used to do that to my high school friends <laughs> where, where they'd be falling too close and try to pass us on the right, and I'd pretend to fall out right in front of the car and they'd slam on the brakes. And, uh, you know, we did stuff like that. Uh, this, a lot of the stuff that we created, uh, you know, uh, in, in making County Line that we just improvised and created that they kept in the movie. And they said, that's why we guys, that's why we cast you two crazy son of a bitch, uh-huh. because of that. <laughs> well, the only one we haven't seen, we're going to see tonight, and it's my last question to you, is what am I in store for to watch Forbidden World? The what now? I'm sorry. Forbidden World. That's the other one that you're very well known for. We're, we're going to watch that tonight. It's one movie of yours I haven't seen, and I just want to know what I'm in store okay. for. Well, you're in store for uh, what is a lot of fun and what at times is a very cheesy film. And you'll see that uh, I make a uh, pretty good uh, Harrison Ford, a poor boy's Harrison Ford. (laughs) (laughs) 
that's why I've been called a dozen times a poor boy Harrison Ford, so I, I'm not ashamed of that. That's okay with me. I just saw him the other night in Cold of the Wild, and I think he's really uh, top notch. I think he did a great job in that film. But in, in Forbidden World, yeah, what to watch for? Uh, well, you won't miss it. The girls are really attractive. That's <laughs> one of the reasons. Roger Corman called me at home and said, you going to do this film? I'm going to send you a script right now. And so I called him back three hours later and said, I'll do it if, if the girls are really beautiful. And that's really shallow of me, but I'm a very shallow guy. <laughs> and so, so did Roger get you? Did Roger talk you into showing your naked butt? Because they couldn't do that in uh, Making County Line. <laughs> well, you know something? It, it's been a great pleasure talking with the both of you guys. <laughs> and uh, uh, you just send me an email, let me know when you guys are going to run this, and uh, so I can catch an earful. Absolutely, Absolutely, yeah. We got to have you in the studio someday. You're 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 great fun. Thank you so much, Jesse, for spending so much time with us tonight. We've had a blast. Well, thank you guys uh, so very much. Uh, am I talking with Tiffany or Terry? Which one? Both. Terry's the the gentleman, and I'm Tiffany. Okay. Okay. Terrific. All right. Uh, thank you so much, both of you guys, uh, and uh, look forward to uh, playing back this interview someday. All and right. Meeting you both in person. Absolutely. So if you come to Los Angeles. Call me so we can get together. Okay? Absolutely, Will absolutely. Do. Have a great rest of your weekend, Jesse. Thank you. All right, bye. Adios, bye-bye. my friends. Adios, bye-bye. bye-bye.